on the air with the city bracing for possible protests. Schools shutting down tomorrow in Akron. As the Ohio Attorney General announced in just the last 90 minutes, there will be no charges against the eight police officers who shot Jalen Walker dozens of times after a traffic stop. Why the AG says it was justified. Plus, the latest on a black teen shot in the head simply because he went to the wrong house to pick up his brothers. In a live report, we'll sort through some of the conflicting info tonight from what police are saying versus what his lawyers are. Plus, could a prison end up built next to Cinderella's castle? That's just one of the new threats raised today from Florida's governor in this power struggle with Disney. And after facing conservative backlash over its partnership with a transgender influencer, we'll have more on Budweiser's new ad that leans hard into a new theme, patriotism. And a complete disaster for Netflix after it couldn't get its live Love is Blind special on TV. What does that mean then for streaming networks looking to compete with the broadcast behemoths for big live events and their big, big audiences? We've got to look at that later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and tonight we're coming on the air with Akron, Ohio, bracing for possible anger and maybe protests, with a grand jury there deciding they will not be charging eight police officers, seven of them white, in connection with last year's deadly shooting of 25-year-old Jalen Walker, who was black. You've got tonight public schools in the city sending out a notice to parents today that, yes, classes will be shut down tomorrow. Over the last few days, we've seen steel barricades installed near the courthouse where this grand jury was deliberating. And officials have been stepping up security measures ahead of today's decision that came down again in just the last 90 minutes. You may remember this, Walker's death sparking days of demonstrations across northern Ohio. Highlighting yet again this conversation about the police use of force against black people. Officers tried to pull Walker over for an alleged traffic violation last June. It ended in them opening fire on Walker and hitting or grazing him with 46 rounds, according to officials. Now, the state's attorney general says today the grand jury decided the officers were legally justified in what they did. Listen. It is critical to remember that Mr. Walker had fired on the police and that he shot first. Jesse Kirsch is live for us in Akron, Ohio. Walk us through this decision, what we know led up to it from the grand jury and what the expectation is tonight into tomorrow in Akron. Yes, yeah, so Hallie, first off, the situation here right now. I want to tell you, downtown Akron, we are just uh, blocks away from the Justice Center here. Calm. You can see behind me, it's pretty much business as usual. There's still traffic moving through downtown. There are some buildings with boarded up windows here, but we have seen that in motion for days. So I just want to make clear right off the bat that things are calm and peaceful here in downtown Akron right now. This decision, this moment was months in the making. This shooting occurred last June, so last summer. And throughout this time, there's been a month long investigation. And the attorney general made a point of saying that. That the special grand jury that was impaneled just to review this case took longer than other grand juries typically do to review evidence. That is how much was being put into this case. We're told it took the grand jury more than a week to review the evidence. Authorities say that they interviewed roughly 50 police officers from the Akron Police Department, including the eight officers who discharged their weapons. Uh, prosecutors also say that they poured over 51 body camera clips, as well as a clip from a dash camera uh, from a police car. And we have seen police body camera footage. So we're talking about a lot of video evidence, a lot of interviews. In fact, uh, roughly 100, I believe it was more than 100 from the press release sent to us, interviews that were conducted. All of that is the investigation. And then, of course, that is all presented to the grand jury. We try to get some answers on what was shared. Couldn't get specifics. But the bottom mm -hmm. line, Hallie, no state level charges against any of the eight officers who shot Jalen Walker. We are getting ready to hear, I know, from Walker's family in just a little bit on this. You mentioned, and it's important to note, this precludes, right, this grand jury decision precludes any state-level charges, but they want the Justice Department to open a federal civil rights investigation into this, right? Right. So this is state level. Again, as you just pointed out, this is state level. That is not uh, this was a state attorney general. This was not federal prosecutors right. speaking at this press conference. The state prosecutors also made a point of saying that this decision doesn't say anything about potential civil action as well. So we could see uh, a lawsuit from the family against the city of Akron, against the police department, against the police officers potentially involved in this. So civil action still possible. As you mentioned, uh, we're going to be looking for any potential federal level action as well. But 
at the state level, no indictment, no criminal charges forthcoming against the eight officers involved. And another thing to remind people, the situation here is different than what a jury would be considering at trial, right? A grand right. jury has a lower burden that they are trying to decide against. Sufficient evidence is what was trying to be decided against here. And obviously, we're used to the term beyond a reasonable doubt when you're dealing with a jury at a trial. So it's just something to make clear here. This was a lower threshold. Seven of the nine grand jurors, the special grand jurors, would have needed to find that sufficient evidence. And all we know is that that clearly did not happen. We do not have the specifics because prosecutors say they are not allowed to share what that vote was. But we do know the makeup of the grand jury. We're told it was it included two black people, three men and six women. Those are all the details we have at this point about those special grand jurors, Hallie. Jesse Kirsch live for us in Akron to start us off tonight. Jesse, thank you. We are getting some new details tonight about the black teenager who was shot in the head because he rang the wrong doorbell while trying to pick up his younger twin brothers. Ralph Yarl, we're learning, is now recovering at home. His family says he's still not able to talk as well as he used to be because of his traumatic brain injury from those two shots to his head and arm. Police have not said who shot him, but Yarl's lawyers say he's a white man and that he said something to Ralph before the shooting. We're learning more about this 16-year-old tonight. His high school says he's a great student. He was taking college-level courses. And when he graduates, Yarl wants to study chemical engineering at Texas A&M. But his real passion, that's music. You see him here with his, bra uh, his, his, his bass clarinet. This was something he loved to do. You also have seen protesters out there demanding justice. Here's what his father told our station in Kansas City. Listen. If he goes free, the next black kid that, you know, ring that doorbell, who gets shot again. Would I want that? Part of what makes this story so notable today isn't just all that big name online attention, although it's true that's out there. Viola Davis, Halle Berry, Justin Timberlake, Kerry Washington, among those asking about accountability. But there are real questions about any accountability here. Why charges haven't been filed and why the person who shot Yarl was let go after just 24 hours. Here's Kansas City's police chief. After consulting with the Clay County Prosecutor's Office, the homeowner was released pending further investigation due to the need to obtain a formal statement from the victim. But Yarl's lawyer says that's actually not the case, telling our Maggie Vespa that Yarl, the 16-year-old, did give his statement in detail over the weekend. Listen. Whether or not the chief is aware of that is, is one thing, but the statement that the reason a proper arrest hasn't been made is because they don't yet have a victim from the statement is a false statement. So the chief either has been misinformed or he's directly misleading the public. Maggie Vespa is live for us in Chicago. Maggie, I know all day, right, all night, you're looking through Missouri law, you're talking to people here, you're talking with family members and right. attorneys, trying to figure out why this person who shot Yarl is not in custody. Now we have this conflicting information as we just laid out. You also spoke with Ralph Yarl's aunt who says she was in the room when that statement was taken. Walk us through this. Yeah, well, and Hallie, I want to start actually with breaking news that we're coming on the air first here to tell you that the Kansas City Police Department just sent us and just released via Twitter uh, a press release that they have actually now passed this case on to the Clay County Prosecutor's Office. They did not say, <clears throat> excuse me, what the arresting charges are. They believe in this case. They did not say what charges they're pursuing or what they expect the prosecutor's office to pursue. But that information, that press release came in response to NBC News asking about the contradiction that you're hitting there right on the head, that basically police yesterday had said they hadn't been able to speak to this 16-year-old, they hadn't been able to get a statement on what Ralph Yarl says happened to him. And then we talked to the family today and they say, no, no, police talked to him on Friday when he was still in the hospital. And he's since been released. He was released on Saturday. So we reached out to Kansas City Police and we said, what's going on? Is the statement there or not? Can we expect charges or not? And now, excuse me, within the last hour, the police department saying, indeed, they have passed this case on to the prosecutor's office, so no charges filed just yet. But that is a paramount step, Hallie, as you know, in this process. Yeah, and explain what that means, Maggie, that this is now being passed to the prosecutor's office. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. Essentially what that means, as you know, is that the prosecutor is going to make the final call on this. Sometimes in high-profile cases like this, they're going to let the prosecutor basically go through the evidence that the police department has put together, decide based on that evidence what kind of charges could come down. We know full well that despite the fact that the police department hasn't yet identified the homeowner in this case, Ralph Yarl's family attorney says this was a white man who shot this young black boy. So the family attorney, the family, and people in the Kansas City community, as 
again, unconfirmed report from police, but from the family attorney, as that detail has kind of permeated out into the public sphere, people have been calling for hate crime charges. Mm. And the family attorney reiterated that call to us today, saying that he believes those should be pursued. And he said, basically, this man would have to explain to a jury that he looked out his window, he saw, in his words, a black silhouette, and he felt fear. And he said, and we the black community are here to say that fear equates to hate. That's what he told us. So again, basically mm. now this is being left up to the prosecutor's office in Clay County. Police say they have finished their investigation. We can assume based on yesterday's press conference, they've also passed along that victim statement. So now we're waiting to hear what, if anything, prosecutors intend to do with this rapidly evolving case. How and I just want to ask about the timeline on that, Maggie, because as you say, this is happening literally as we are on the air here, that this has been passed to the prosecutor's right. office. Presumably the next step would be the prosecutor's office reviewing it and then sharing perhaps publicly what their decision is on this. And in the meantime, Ralph Yarrow's home, right? We know that his family says his speech yes. is not all the way back, but he is home and recovering. Yeah, he was shot in the head. He has a traumatic brain uh, injury. His speech is not all the way back, but they're hopeful for a full recovery. Okay. Second shot was to the arm. So they say they're just glad that he survived and he's healing one day at a time. Allie. Maggie Vespa, all over these new developments for us late tonight from Kansas City. Maggie, thank you. We are just now learning the names of the four people killed after another mass shooting in this country, this time at a Sweet 16 party just south of Birmingham, Alabama. You see the names here. Corbin Holston, Marcia Collins, Sean Kevia Smith, and Fulstavius Dowdo, who was just 18 years old. Dowdo was just about to play football at Jacksonville State University. He played wide receiver, defensive back. His coach says, Phil did it all. And there's this terrible picture that's sticking with our team. Look at this, the fire department cleaning off a bloody handprint from the dance studio. A ton of questions about this investigation. Police are not saying who the shooter is, if they even have a person of interest. On top of that, no clue about a motive. Why would somebody target a 16-year-old's birthday party? And it's not clear how the 28 other people who got hurt in this shooting are doing, if they were shot or just got hurt trying to run to safety. This attack now has more victims, dead and hurt, of any shooting this year. Priscilla Thompson is live on the ground in Dadeville for us tonight. We mentioned all those big questions, Priscilla. Any closer to any answers tonight, or do we know when we may hear more? Well, Holly, police did not hold a press conference today, and so if they are any closer to those answers, they are not yet releasing that information publicly. As you mentioned, no word on motive, no word on the identity of a suspect or if anyone has been arrested. In fact, they didn't even release the names of the victims. We had to obtain that through the coroner's office. The only thing that police here have said is that there were four people who were killed and 28 people injured. We have checked in with a local hospital that received around 15 of those patients. They told us that all 15 of those people had gunshot wounds and at least four of them were in critical condition when they had to be transferred to other hospitals. So it is possible that the death toll here could continue to rise as this community continues to seek answers. Hallie? You spoke with Phil Dowdell's football coach who says he just feels numb right now. Yeah, Hallie, and you see a bit of a memorial beginning to grow behind me where that yellow tarp is covering the door where all of this erupted. But there was a vigil held late last night, and we I spoke with the head coach, and he said that he is still in disbelief. He got the call Saturday night and rushed out of bed to be here with uh, his students. He has been comforting members of the football team, uh, telling me that he hugs them and he just tells them that he loves them. But in his mind, he's thinking about them throwing touchdown passes to Phil, and I want to play a little bit more of what he shared with me. Take a listen. I'll be honest. I, I, there was no thought. There's, for whatever that means, I, there was nothing. There was, you were just trying to process everything. And everyone that I've spoken to among those teammates describes Phil as someone who had a smile that could light up a room. And so today in this community, people are trying to find ways to honor those four victims and support those 28 people who were injured as they continue on the road to recovery. Hallie? Priscilla Thompson live for us there in Dadeville, Alabama. Priscilla, thank you.
A desperate search tonight for three experienced sailors lost at sea who haven't been heard from in nearly two weeks. We're talking about Carrie O'Brien, her husband Frank, and their friend William Gross. Together they have about 100 years of sailing experience combined. The O'Briens even have Coast Guard captain's licenses. The group was last heard from April 4th as they left from Mazatlan, Mexico. They were supposed to stop in Cabo a couple days later for supplies, but the Coast Guard says there's no record of them getting there. Dana Griffin is joining us now. Boat didn't have a lot of tech on board, we hear. What else do we know about who these sailors are? What kind of supplies they may have had? What about the weather? What do we know? Mm -hmm. Well, here's what we know so far. Reached out to the U.S. Coast Guard today, and they have no new updates on the search. Now, the group was traveling on the O'Brien's 44-foot sailing vessel called Oceanbound. And as you mentioned, the three have a combined 100 years of sailing experience. Right now, the U.S. Coast Guard is focused on a 2,500-square-mile area. So the crew did set sail from what's considered a do not travel zone because of cartels and violence. But authorities tell family members that they don't believe the boat would be a target for cartels. So, Hallie, the more likely scenario here is rough seas. Now, the Coast Guard tells us that the boat may have encountered winds over 30 knots and 20 foot waves. And unfortunately, Hallie, this that is actually the big concern here. It has been 13 yeah. days since they set sail off the coast of Mazatlan, and they were heading to San Diego, a trip that should have taken two days. Cell phone pings from Tuesday, April 4th, show the boat called into Cabo San Lucas. They had planned to stop there for those supplies, but the Coast Guard, as you mentioned, says there is no record of them arriving. Officials do not believe they had enough fuel or food on board, which is why they are aggressively pursuing the search yeah. and rescue. Now, the families of those lost sailors are hopeful that their experience at sea will hopefully bring them home safely. Hallie? You gotta imagine so many people praying for a miracle here 13 days later. Yeah. Dana Griffin, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Today, the judge overseeing that huge Fox Dominion defamation trial everybody's been waiting for is telling reporters that, hey, this last minute change in schedule isn't really unusual as he's delaying the trial until tomorrow with some last minute reports that maybe. There could be an 11th hour settlement right before the case is supposed to head to the jury in the morning. Remember, at the center of this case, whether or not Fox defamed Dominion voting systems by airing lies about their voting machines after the 2020 presidential election. Dominion wants $1.6 billion in damages, although we're going to put a little asterisk on that. Eamon Javers is joining us now to explain. We've been hearing reporting, Eamon, all day that maybe this delay, we thought this trial was starting today, opening arguments today. You'd be coming on talking to us about opening arguments. Instead, you're coming on talking to us about the potential for maybe opening arguments tomorrow if there is this settlement here. What do we know? What can you tell us? Yeah, Hallie, there's just been this tsunami of speculation about a possible settlement here, but the reality is we just don't know anything. I've been emailing folks. I was over staking out the hotel where the legal teams are staying. Oh, boy. Uh, both sides have been very tight-lipped throughout the day today. Uh, despite our best efforts, we haven't gotten any indication of where things stand. The judge was very tight-lipped this morning. So what we know as of now is that last night we got word just after about 8 p.m. that the trial was going to be delayed. So we'll keep an eye out into the evening tonight, but officially they are starting here tomorrow. Tomorrow at 9 a.m., uh, we're going to go into jury selection. They're going to each side will have the opportunity to pick from the jury pool as they go through the day, uh, and then the whole thing is expected to last about five or six weeks. The judge at pains, as you say this morning, to say nothing unusual about a one-day delay. But of course, as you know, Hallie, that means everybody is speculating that maybe Fox wants to settle this in the wake of some real adverse rulings by this judge in the run-up to trial day. And so, given that, right, we put that asterisk, asterisk on the $1.6 billion number, there's been some back and forth on that figure, right? Explain it, explain what that means, and yep. then explain the business piece of this with some experts perhaps saying, hey, Fox could handle maybe a settlement like that. Their stock price could take a dip, but ultimately that may be how they decide to go if this is even on the table. Yeah, definitely it's clear that Fox could afford this. The question is how much damage to their business opportunities, you know, happens going forward. And that's a real question because they've got to renegotiate with all the cable carriers to carry Fox News on all those carriers. And the question is how much money is that worth in the wake of these damaging revelations? What we saw over the past 24, 48 hours is a series of rival motions back and forth by Fox and Dominion. Fox suggesting that Dominion had lowered its demand from that 1.6 
figure uh, by about a half a billion dollars. Dominion following up very quickly with another following filing saying, wait, 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 no, we didn't. We still want the full 1.6. So that's where the bidding is right now. Dominion saying they deserve $1.6 billion because these lies damaged Dominion's yeah. business. Fox saying, no, this is the first Amer this is the First Amendment. We're allowed to do this. And that's why this case is being so closely watched, Eamon, as you know, because of those First Amendment questions that are coming up. PSA, if Eamon Javers is staking out your hotel, okay. you should go talk to him. I hope that uh, that advice reaches the proper ears. Eamon, thank Thanks. you very much. Thanks I'm sure we'll see you again soon. You bet. A tense and pretty testy scene with House Republicans trekking north to New York for a kind of field trip to talk violent crime in that city. Not exactly friendly territory for those GOP members, including Judiciary Chairman Jim Jordan. Listen. You're a scumbag. Every Let single me tell you this. I got you all on video with your face. The hearing is a sham. The hearing is a sham. Indict Jim Jordan. Indict Jim Jordan. The hearing is supposed to highlight what Republicans see as the way the Manhattan DA, they think, is neglecting crime issues to instead focus more on pursuing charges against former President Trump. But if Alvin Bragg had not indicted Mr. Trump this month, would this hearing even be happening at all? I believe this hearing would be happening regardless, whether it would be today or later on in the year, because this is an issue that I've been highlighting and pressing uh, with my colleagues over and over again. Keep in mind the context here. New York is actually one of the safest big cities in the country. Not even look. This is a list of the top 15 most dangerous cities in America. New York's not on it. NBC's Ryan Nobles is in New York outside the location of that hearing there. And this was interesting, Ryan. We see you on Capitol Hill. It is not often that Capitol Hill takes a field trip to New York, a city that's actually seen less violent crime recently, even though some of these House Republicans are talking about a spike. Help us understand what this is really about. Is this about crime? Is this about politics? Is this about Donald Trump? Or is it, you know, option D, all of the above? I think option D, uh, Hallie, I think you're pretty smart to put it in those contexts, because I do think uh, even though the Republicans that we pressed on uh, about this today uh, tried to get around the idea that the indictment of the former president wouldn't have precipitated this hearing, uh, I don't think that's true. I do think that they certainly wanted to draw attention to the district attorney, Alvin Bragg. But there's also a companion effort here by Republicans to make crime a big issue, not just here in New York State, but across the country. And listen to how they framed it today during the hearing this morning. You can resist arrest, deal drugs, obstruct arrest, and even carry a gun to get away with it. Yeah, I think a lot of people walk around the city very scared right now. There is a catastrophic crime crisis across America. Now, obviously, Alvin Bragg does not agree with the way Republicans were framing his work in the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. This is how he responded to the hearing today. He said, for outside politicians to appear in New York City on the taxpayer's dime for a political stunt is a slap in the face to the dedicated New York Police Department officers, prosecutors, and other public servants. You know, there was uh, an opportunity here for Democrats just to ignore this, Hallie. Hmm. They've taken the other route, and they That's are right. taking it head on. Uh, not just allowing the Republicans to go unanswered. It's not like these House Republicans are any fans of Alvin Bragg. They want to see him come to Capitol Hill. They want to bring him in to answer questions about this investigation of Donald Trump. Alvin Bragg has basically st said, I'm paraphrasing, stay in your lane, Congress. This is a you know, New York issue, not a congressional issue. Bottom line, are we ever going to see Alvin Bragg testifying in front of Congress here, in front of those House Republicans like they want? I think it's very unlikely, Hallie. There, there's a pending lawsuit right now that Bragg has filed uh, to basically prevent not only him but anybody in his office from being forced to answer a subpoena. Uh, he has uh, recently gotten amicus brief today from uh, the former district attorney, Cyrus Vance, and some others uh, who are in support of that legal effort. Uh, they're going to do everything they can, these House Republicans, to try and make a show out of this. But whether yeah. or not they have the legal ground, the true oversight, to actually force Bragg and his associates to come before him, that's an open question, and it's not something that's going to be answered anytime soon. Ryan Nobles, live for us in New York City. Safe travels back home to the Capitol. Thanks, Ryan. The United Nations saying today at least 180 people are dead. Nearly 2,000 others have been hurt from airstrikes, from shelling, from gunfire, with two rival generals fighting for control of that country. It is a drastic turn for Sudan which only four years ago got rid of its longtime autocratic leader in favor of democracy. The Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, today 
calling for a return to a government led by civilians. Listen. People in Sudan want the military back in the barracks. They want democracy. They want a civilian-led government. Sudan needs to return to that path. NBC's Kier Simmons is covering this first. We're glad to have you here in Washington, Good Kier. Here. Um, so listen, no change, right, to the idea that there are Americans who are in Sudan. Uh, yeah, the State are. Department said we're not evacuating. People yeah. should shelter in place. What do we need to know about where this goes next and the two generals who are... Um, behind so much of this violence. Yeah, no surprise they're saying we can't evacuate because it's... They don't have control of the airports. Right what are they exactly. going to do? Where are they going to land the planes? International airports yeah. on fire. The civilian aircraft are severely damaged, according to the satellite pictures that we've seen. I mean, just take a look at the pictures. I mean, we've got fighter jets uh, flying overhead of the, the capital Khartoum. Uh, we've got uh, shooting uh, in yeah. blocks uh, around uh, that capital. We, I actually spoke to an American travel writer who was there, you know, traveling through northeast uh, Africa. They're recently Port or they're currently? No, they're now. Now, wow. caught in the middle of it, she says that she saw uh, exchanges of fire just blocks away uh, from her. That she thought at first it was a thunderstorm, uh, terrifying. Uh, so yeah, it's it's changing. I'll give you an example of just how difficult the situation is. Uh, the U.S. ambassador sheltering in place. The reports uh, tonight that the EU ambassador has been insulted in his own home. Oh, wow. Now, you want to know why this is important? Uh, two uh, good reasons, aside from just, you know, the, the, civil, the, 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 the civilian... Right? Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, one is that uh, this is a, a fledgling... Uh, democracy, uh, trying to bring in a civilian government, uh, and now that's in trouble. And, of course, President Biden's, you know, hope is to try and support democracies around the world. But you're not seeing uh, that there. Another is that because is so, so Sudan is a strategically important place. I mean, it's kind of been battled over between Russia and the U.S. over a long period of time. Uh, get this, uh, calls tonight from the U.S., Russia and China for a, an end to this fighting between, as you say, these two uh, military leaders who are feuding, actually, uh, fighting over over the opportunity to to run the place if you like so forget democracy is that unified front from these three adversaries, the U.S., China, Russia, going to be enough to get a resolution? Yeah, I mean, I call it a unified front. I mean, clearly they're not unified. They've all got their own interests. But uh, you would hope so. But let's see. I don't think that the situation is, is in control right now. Uh, Keir Simmons, thank you for staying on top of that for us. A lot of developments on that story tonight. Appreciate it. Coming up, the L.A. District Attorney reviewing allegations of sexual assault against actor Army Hammer. We'll talk about what we know about this investigation. Plus, speaking of Hollywood, writers there just approving a strike. We'll tell you what's at stake coming up in The Five Things. NBC News learning today that the L.A. District Attorney's Office is now reviewing allegations of sexual assault against actor Army Hammer related to a case that the LAPD opened back in 2021. That's according to a source familiar with the investigation. In a statement, the District Attorney's Office says the LAPD presented a case for them to look at. They didn't specify which case. NBC News has reached out to Hammer. His lawyer says they're not commenting right now. In the past, he said his interactions with his partners have always been consensual. Keep in mind that Hammer has been in big movies like The Social Network, where he played the Winklevoss twins. He was in Call Me By Your Name, The Man From U.N.C.L.E. Aaron McLaughlin is joining us now. Aaron, what do we know tonight about all this? Hey, Hallie. Well, as you pointed out, these allegations first came to light in February of 2021 when a woman who called herself only Effie came forward very publicly accusing Army Hammer of violent rape. She alleges that during the course of an on and off relationship that took place between 2016 and 2020, in 2017, she alleges that he violently raped her in Los Angeles for four hours. She made these allegations very public at the time side by side with her then attorney, Gloria Allred. And now we're learning from a source familiar with the investigation that that investigation has in fact closed recently. It's unclear when exactly the investigation closed and then with the results of which have been forwarded to the district attorney, the district attorney, a spokesperson saying that they're currently reviewing a case involving Army Hammer. Unclear how long that review process could last. Worth noting, no charges so far have been filed. Now, we have reached out to Effie uh, to ask her for a comment on today's development. We have yet to hear back. We also reached out to Army Hammer and his attorney, his attorney declining to comment. But back in 2021, his attorney releasing a statement saying that all of Hammer's sexual relationships have been completely consensual, discussed and agreed upon in advance and mutually participatory. Hallie. 
Aaron McLaughlin, thank you very much for that. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, Hollywood writers have just voted to authorize a strike if their talks with the Alliance of Motion Picture and TV Producers doesn't end in a new three-year contract. The current contract is set to expire in just a few weeks on May 1st. The writers want more money and better working conditions. They're supposed to pick up negotiations again today. Number two, a couple familiar faces back on Capitol Hill today. On the left there, the top Senate Republican, Mitch McConnell. On the right, Pennsylvania, Senator John Fetterman. McConnell's back for the first time since he tripped and fell at a D.C. hotel. He got a concussion like six weeks ago. Fetterman is back two months after being treated for clinical depression. Number three, in battle, Congressman George Santos. Controversial Congressman George Santos says, hey, he's going to run again in 2024. Remember, he's facing calls to resign. He's also facing a bunch of investigations at the federal, state, and local level, all because he repeatedly lied about his background, both before he was elected and since taking office. Number four, soggy marathon Monday for runners in Boston today. Tenth anniversary of the Boston Marathon bombings that killed three people and hurt hundreds of others. The defending champ Evans Shibet of Kenya won the men's to become the first back-to-back -back winner in Boston in 15 years. Helen O'Beary, also of Kenya, got the women's title, her first pro marathon title. Officials say 30,000 runners from more than 100 countries participated. Even if you're not one of those two winners, you are still a winner in my eyes. Number five, McDonald's. Upgrading its burgers, they're going to have a softer bun, meltier cheese, more caramelly flavor, and more Big Mac sauce. The company says they're doing it to try to boost sales. So if you head to McDonald's, that's what to expect. When we come back, another twist in Florida's feud with Disney. Why the governor's talking about in sending in more inspectors to check out Disney's rides or maybe even opening a prison nearby. That's next. You will never believe what a police officer found inside a quesadilla that led to somebody getting arrested. We're going to show you later in the local. But first, a new twist tonight in that political power struggle between Florida's governor and Disney, with Ron DeSantis now threatening to maybe let a new prison be built right near the park, one of the state's biggest tourist attractions. And that's not all we're hearing from DeSantis today, as he's rolling out a new plan to try and stop Disney from keeping so much control of the land it's built on. Right now, for example, the park's rides don't have to be inspected by the state. That could change. Maybe he'll send in more inspectors. Then there's the question of what happens to the land around Disney, which the governor says could potentially be redeveloped. Listen. People have said, you know, maybe maybe have a, another, uh, maybe create a state park, maybe try to do more amusement uh, parks. Uh, someone even said, like, maybe you need another state prison. Who knows? I mean, I just think that the, the possibilities are, 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 are endless. So he sees endless possibilities here. Keep in mind, this is just the latest move in this Florida feud. It started after Disney spoke up against the state's controversial so-called don't say gay law last year. DeSantis didn't like that. So he installed some allies to try and take control of a board that oversees Disney's district. Except Disney, before he did, made its own surprise power play to keep control. And that is where he ended up where we are now, Sam Brock, who was live for us in Florida. So you heard that from DeSantis, right? He's talking about all these things that could end up happening right around the state's biggest tourist attraction. Maybe they inspect the monorail, which they didn't have to do before. It's like, throw in some red tape. Is, is any of this going to actually happen? In other words, are these threats actually going to become reality for Disney? Yeah, that's an open-ended question right now, Hallie, and a pretty wide variance from state park to state prison. And that's what yeah. DeSantis apparently wants to do right now, is to create a little bit of confusion. I will say this. It is incredibly convoluted. It is not just you. I've been talking to lawyers. They are still trying to wrap their head around what exactly is going on here. One of those attorneys specializes in government law, and he said he would be surprised if the actions of the DeSantis-backed board uh, would necessarily, and so the state legislature as well, would necessarily change any of the dynamic here. Because let's go back in time for a second and try to put together what actually happened in late February of the state legislature come in and allow Governor DeSantis to create this board, his hand-picked allies in your own words. But before they are able to actually get seated, Disney and its current board, the Reedy Creek Improvement District, they come together, which, by the way, that board is made up of Disney 
property owners on the land, right? So it's Disney working with Disney. They come up with agreements that protect their autonomy, protect their ability to tax, to do all of these things. So now there needs to be a violation to change that, which tees up a legal fight. DeSantis, I am told, can move forward with complaints about special treatment that Disney is receiving, but not necessarily because of a particular political stance, not as retaliation. And that's where the legal argument goes. I spoke with that attorney, Jacob Schumer. Here is how he sees the holes in DeSantis's case. They have an argument. The problem is that it's directly tied to something Disney said, that is their political stance on a matter, which means that the First Amendment comes into play. And you cannot retaliate against uh, anybody uh, for their protected speech, such as stating opposition to the law. And that includes corporations. Hallie, something really important to, to point out from earlier today in that entire 30 or 45 minute press conference. What did you not hear Governor DeSantis discuss? Don't say gay, the parental rights That's and education true. law, woke activism, anything about culture wars. Yeah. Some of his colleagues did. He avoided it like the plague. And then I guess the question becomes, is that because his attorney said that would not be wise hmm. to do that, given the political landscape right now? I guess we'll find out. Do we have any sense of timeline, Sam? In other words, when we may have some more answers to some of these questions? That's a great question. So we know on Wednesday that the board is going to be meeting. I'm told that they're going to state their opposition to what Disney did, that they're going to try and void and nullify what was done. But then there's also the legislative action that has to come into play. They can state all of this all they want, but then the ball goes back to Disney's court. And if Disney decides to pursue legal action for violating the covenants that they set up that protects their own land, Hallie, right, then right. you get into a legal fight. And you made this point off the top of your segment here, which is the fact that you can't just put in a state prison or put in housing or whatever it is that DeSantis wants to do on someone else's land. Clearly, there's going to be legal pushback to their autonomy to be able to do that. Sam Brock, following every twist and turn in this one. Sam, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Coming up, Clydesdales, U.S. flags, the Lincoln Memorial, all showing up in Budweiser's new ad after backlash over a recent endorsement deal. So is it enough to get customers back? Plus, how changing our diet could help the environment. The foods you might have to give up to fight climate change. Not that you might have to, but anyways, researchers are talking about it. Next. So Budweiser is out with its first ad since that huge controversy over trans influencer Dylan Mulvaney's uh, use showing off of the beer in a social media post. This is all after that statement from Anheuser-Busch's CEO saying that they never intended to be part of a discussion that divides people, that they're in the business of bringing together people over a beer. That's after a March Madness promotion in which Bud Light teamed up with various social media influencers, including Dylan Mulvaney. Her post is what sparked so much of this backlash, a kind of boycott, with the company losing something like six and a half billion dollars. You saw customers, celebrities calling for people to destroy the beers, for example, putting videos of themselves on social media, like driving over the beers, Kid Rock, shooting at Bud Light cans, etc. Katie Beck is joining us now. And here we have the latest twist in this turn, this saga, if you will, with Bud Bud Light, um, which is a leaning into themes of Americana in what frankly seems aimed just from the outside at trying to win back some of those more conservative customers who boycotted Bud Light over its post with Dylan Mulvaney. Hey, Hallie, yeah, this was actually speaking to those perhaps supporters or customers who have abandoned the brand in recent weeks, trying to win them back by putting out basically the most patriotic thing you can think of, Clydesdale horses taking a tour from New York City uh, across the, the Grand Canyon. I mean, it, it was about as all-American as you could get in an ad, and whether it worked uh, will yet to be determined. I mean, I think that the, the customers here have spoken in terms of what they find acceptable, and clearly this was not it. The question now is, how do you regain those customers? I spoke to one bar owner I know in South Carolina, and he said that the profit losses and, and the excess Bud Light he has in his restaurant and bar are real. Uh, hmm. He says people are, he says, I've had, I've have more sitting on a shelf in the past few weeks than I've ever had in my 16 years of running this establishment. So I do think it's having a very tangible effect and a, a dollars and cents effect on, uh, on what's going on with the company. Are there any takeaways for other brands here? 
I mean, I certainly think other brands are watching this as perhaps a litmus test of uh, what is good marketing, what is going to work. But I think that, that knowing your customer base, um, knowing what their expectations are is part of that. And I certainly think that other companies might be, you know, really taking a, a hard look at how this turned out. I mean, the backlash even since that commercial, even since this statement, uh, the social media posts have just been explosive and, and very one-sided. Uh, those, those Bud Light loyalists, a lot of them are, are turning the other way and saying we're, we're never going to drink this beer again. We have other brands to turn to, and uh, we don't want to mix our politics and our beer, and certainly this wasn't, wasn't their flavor. Sure. You also look at, you know, brands, I think of Nike, for example, um, came out, you know, has been taken some backlash and continued on kind of a different course. So it is an interesting sort of case study here. Katie Beck, thank you very much. Appreciate it. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. From our Midwest Bureau, at least one person has died in a fungal outbreak at a paper mill in Michigan. Public health officials say nearly 100 workers in all were infected with blastomycosis, this deadly fungus. Some people started feeling sick last month, getting like pneumonia-esque symptoms. The mill will shut down for about three weeks now. Out of our Southern Bureau, Mississippi police say a man tried to hide a gun inside a quesadilla during a traffic stop. Cops noticed the passenger put something into a Taco Bell bag. Turns out it was a gun. Uh, officers also found things like heroin and drug paraphernalia. The passenger is now facing multiple charges related to this. From our Northeast Bureau, check out this video. A pizza delivery driver in Pennsylvania being called a hero for stopping a suspected car thief. So you're watching the delivery driver walk up to a home, turns around, and then look. You're about to see it. He's going to trip the suspect. Tough to see in this shot here. Here comes. Here comes the suspect. Ready? Trips him. Boom. Police say that guy was running away from him. And this delivery driver didn't even drop the pizza. Officers say because of his quick thinking, they were able to make an arrest. So could going vegan save the world? From a climate perspective, it may make a big difference, according to a new study that says cutting down on meat and dairy and eggs could cut back on carbon emissions by almost 60%. Our Maura Barrett takes a closer look in a new series we're calling Climate Changes, looking at how the climate crisis is changing how we live and maybe, in this instance, how we eat. Fire a Billy and a Reuben. Masio's Butcher Shop in L.A. is known for its Californian sandwich, stacked with bacon, turkey, and gouda. But all that meat and cheese is actually entirely made from plants. It smells just like bacon grease. Yeah. Okay. I know. <laughs> I feel like that's the point. Yeah. <laughs> As a nutritionist, it's been Masio's dream for years to open a space like this. The shop is basically the combination of all the things that I care the most, which is like animal welfare, healthy eating, and the environment, the planet. What does your ideal customer look like here? The meat eaters. <laughs> she and her partner, Joe, are fighting something bigger than the lunch rush. Their goal? Helping people realize just how effective plant-based food can be when it comes to fighting climate change. How does eating this sandwich contribute to helping the climate? The carbon footprint is pretty minimal compared to what it takes to create actual turkey and actual bacon. A recent study found plant-based food production accounts for nearly half as many greenhouse gas emissions as animal-based food. I think what's become, coming more into focus is our diet. Definitely affects climate change. Put another way, if you were to eat a hamburger made from farmed cows every day for a year, the greenhouse gas emissions would be equivalent to driving a car more than 7,000 miles. That's two and a half times across the country. But if that same burger was made from beans instead, the equivalent car trip would be just 93 miles, about the distance from New York City to Philadelphia. For Patrick Brown, co-founder of plant-based food company Impossible Foods, it's just smart business. The use of animals in food production is by a wide margin the most destructive technology in the world today. Reducing or eliminating animal agriculture, reducing as much as possible, is the world's best and maybe only chance to actually put the brakes on global heating. There's this dream or idea that someone can bite into a sandwich or a burger and not know whether it's plant-based or real meat. Do you see that as being the future? I see it as being the present, to be honest. There are plant-based products on the market that in blind taste says to consumers, 
are identified as meat unambiguously and preferred over the animal product, it's not at all unreasonable to think that within a decade or so, there could be a flip where the better technology that produces products that are more delicious, more nutritious, and very soon they'll be more affordable than the animal products. Have a good one. A plant-based future that for some is close enough to taste. Thumbs up for me. Hallie, researchers point out that meat eaters are open to making the switch to a plant-based diet. In fact, Good Food Institute found that 93% of Americans bought a combination of plant-based and animal meat last year. Now, as consumers are thinking about it, as you might expect, the big factors they're considering are taste and price. Now, taste has made leaps and bounds in development over the last few years. That's why you see companies like Chipotle, Starbucks, Taco Bell really capitalizing on this market. Now, as for price, developments are moving quickly, technology is improving, and with more options on the market, that means that prices could even out or even ultimately cost less than that animal meat option. Now, big picture, either way you look at it, this is becoming more and more popular. The plant-based uh, industry right now is valued at $30 billion globally, and Bloomberg Intelligence predicts that this number could triple, more than triple, by 2030. Hallie? Our thanks to Moore Barrett for that reporting. So to come, the Love is Blind reunion broke the internet for all the wrong reasons. Now it's out as a recorded version. What went wrong and what it may mean for the future of live streaming stuff that you actually want to see. Coming up. So it was supposed to be one of the buzziest live shows of the season. The Love is Blind reunion on Netflix. Maybe millions of people tuning in. The countdown on. And 19 hours after showtime, the countdown was still going up until about two hours ago when Netflix finally rolled out the reunion show on tape after a massive live production fiasco. Vanessa Lachey, one of the hosts, apologizing, even as Netflix's stock took a ding today, all of it, raising questions about what the business model looks like for streamers who want to get in on what the broadcast companies have been doing for years, big live events. Because after all, that's one of the few things left that tons of people are actually watching. It's partly why you're seeing, for example, Amazon get in on streaming football, Apple TV+, Plus, Peacock, baseball, sports is a huge draw for audiences. It's live. It's an event. But what could it mean down the road if streaming platforms can't actually get it done from a production perspective? What does that mean for those audiences and those eyeballs? I want to bring in Jake Ward. And Jake, listen. In Netflix's defense, they did pull off a live comedy special featuring Chris Rock last month. Fine. But given what an epic fail this reunion show thing was last night, how did they come back from this? You know, I, I think, I mean, first of all, right, let's be clear, Hallie, right, that this, the company's going to be fine. They're doing just fine in the money department, well, okay, in the okay, audience okay. department, I don't right? Mean they from reach a, I don't mean tens from a of millions of people in that way. No, I get you. I'm I get talking you. about, like, if they're trying right. to get but from But this being, reputational being, thing, yes, yeah. Yes, yes. That's right. Well, I think that, you know, if you're going to try to move into live, which is this basically this effort on their part and on the part of all sorts of streaming platforms to try and find a new market, especially as Netflix and other platforms like this begin to discover that they may have really tapped out, you know, gotten to the very peak of the streaming market. They may have sold as many subscriptions to this as they're going to on their current business model. They're looking for something new. And so the question here winds up being, is this a single embarrassing debacle in which they just did not have the production capability? Capability. Supposedly a new production company had been brought on for this fourth season, and maybe that's where the problem is. Uh, the reporting from inside Netflix seems to be this was some sort of technical issue. You and I who work in live television think, oh, you know, how hard could it be? I mean, we work really hard, but, you know, you can get this thing done. <laughs> I don't done. think how hard can they, it be. But I, I do think, think not how hard it can it be. We professional know how hard operation, it is. And, like, it's a whole specialty, right? That's it's right. not just something that you can dabble in on the side. I, I mean, my two cents on that. That turns out to be the case. That's exactly right. But I think in the f what we're going to see is more and more people try to attempt this, especially with all the buzz they got around this, even as they failed to pull this one off on time. What's so interesting to me, and you're talking about it here, right? It, it is the reputational piece of it. Because, yeah, Netflix, from a business perspective, will be just fine. They are the king of binge TV. But you've got Amazon doing sports. We talked about Apple, Peacock, et cetera. Um, and so much of this seems to be, and I say sports because that is one of the last big things that people want to watch live because it's happening, you're sort of this communal event. 
But it's happening is there's all these sort of silos that seem to be coming down in the eyes of viewers between streaming and broadcast and cable, right? We talk about this a lot all the time, not just because we are on a streaming channel here, but because that's where the business, the business world is. Content is content, and it doesn't matter how you get it these days. I think that's right. I think, though, we are seeing something really weird here in this moment where you have these major platforms fighting for sports, right, because that market is intended, you know, is expected to, to go from being worth about $19 billion a couple of years ago to being worth uh, over $90 billion come 2030. The live streaming of sports continues to grow as a business. But what's also weird here, Hallie, is at the same time that we're talking about the death of live television, live streaming of just YouTubers, right? And people on Instagram and people on TikTok, that is exploding. And psychologists, I've been spending the last 24 hours ever since this debacle took place looking into the psychology of this stuff. There's a word for this. They call it social presence. This is the mm. psychological effect of being present with someone, even through the mediating effects of television or a phone or anything else. We like to feel that we are live with someone. It has all of these sort of secondary impacts that psychologists struggle to really tell us why they happen, but they can see that they are there. We feel closer to people. We're more likely yeah. to buy products. I get people that. like live stuff. So all of that is happening, even as this particular production company definitely uh, uh, did not pull this one off. Uh, uh, quite the flop, in fact, indeed. Jake Ward, uh, thank you very much. Fascinating stuff. I appreciate it. That does it for us for this hour. Coverage picks up right now. So any minute now, the family of Jalen Walker is set to speak after an Ohio grand jury in the last couple of hours declined to bring charges against the eight police officers who shot him dozens of times after a traffic stop. Why the AG says it was justified as schools in Akron get ready to shut down. Also happening now, another live event. We are expecting to hear from prosecutors in Missouri about potential charges after a person shot a black teen in the head because he showed up at the wrong house to pick up his brothers. We're going to bring you that live, and we'll tell you what our team is hearing from Ralph Jarl's aunt right here on NBC News Now. Plus, out in L.A., a new investigation into allegations of sexual assault against the actor Army Hammer, what we're finding out tonight from the district attorney. And could a prison end up built next to Cinderella's castle? That is just one of the new threats raised today from Florida's governor in the power struggle with Disney. And in tonight's original, we're looking at the future of food, why some experts think going vegan could help save our climate. That's later in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and any minute now, we'll be hearing from the family of Jalen Walker after a grand jury in Akron, Ohio, decided they will not be charging eight police officers, seven of them white, in connection to last year's deadly shooting of the 25-year-old who is black. You've got the city bracing for the potential for protests. Things are calm now. Public schools in the city are sending out a notice to parents today. The classes will be called off tomorrow. You see here, the city's been prepping over the last seven, maybe 48, 72 hours in the event of demonstrations, businesses boarding up, barricades installed near the courthouse where this grand jury was deliberating. Some roads were closed ahead of the decision today. You'll remember Walker's death sparked days of demonstrations across northern Ohio, highlighting yet again this conversation about police use of force against black people. Officers tried to pull Walker over for an alleged traffic violation last June, which ended in them opening fire on Walker and hitting or grazing him with 46 rounds, according to officials. The state's attorney general saying today the grand jury decided the officers were legally justified in what they did, and here's why. Listen. It is critical to remember that Mr. Walker had fired on the police and that he shot first. Jesse Kirsch is live for us in Akron tonight. Talk to us about what we expect later tonight and what led to this decision by the grand jury, Jesse. Yes, yeah, so, well, so what I can tell you, Hallie, is what the city is prepared for. Uh, they had for days been announcing that there would be a demonstration zone where people can be protesting peacefully in the street without worrying about traffic going by. And I just checked with our producer, one of our producers out here, and that demonstration zone is now in effect. Traffic, we're told, is being blocked off in that area just a few blocks from where we are right now in downtown Akron. For days, we have seen windows in this community boarded up. That is, again, the case tonight. But as you can see behind 
behind me, not anything that appears to be out of the normal activity. We're certainly seeing police patrolling in the area, but we've got the public buses moving through, cars still driving by, uh, and people have been walking and on their bikes through the downtown area as well. So uh, if you were dropping yourself in here right now, it would feel like business as usual, perhaps, and then you might check your phone and get an update on the news and realize that something that this community has been bracing for, that news has just come down. So that's what the city is preparing for. Uh, just a moments ago, a press conference with city officials with police and the mayor wrapping up the city again reiterating that they will protect citizens right to protest but that they must do so peacefully and as you mentioned we're waiting to hear from the family of Jalen Walker the 25 year old black man who was shot and killed by that uh, group of police officers last June it was a month long investigation culminating with more than a week of a presentation of evidence to that special grand jury as the state attorney general mentioned earlier and as you said Hallie at this point there are no state, state-level criminal charges that will be filed against those officers, Hallie. You talk about, and we've been looking live, Jesse, um, just so viewers understand where that news conference we expect to see from Walker's family is. We're looking at that now. They're in Akron. They have been calling on um, a federal civil rights investigation here. And I want to be clear, this grand jury decision today precludes state charges. What do we know about the possibility of a civil rights investigation on the federal level? Any idea? Uh, so we haven't heard, uh, best I can tell, obviously it's a fluid situation, haven't seen any kind of announcement from the Justice Department or anything like that. However, we do know that there have been calls, as you mentioned, from the family, uh, also calls from others for uh, some kind of federal investigation into the situation here in Akron. So this is an evolving situation, and I'm sure we're going to be hearing more about that in the hours and the days ahead. Uh, we know that the Akron police officers, we were just told by the city, will be be remaining on what's being described as limited duty. So we don't know what exactly uh, the details of their work at this point will include. And I'm just checking again what our team said, limited duty. Yeah, that's the phrase that's used. We know that previously they'd been placed on administrative duty. That was a move uh, that the family of Jalen Walker was not happy with, and that was months ago. Uh, so we'll be waiting to hear their latest reaction to everything just moments from now. I know that's something we're waiting for. The other thing, uh, besides the possibility of of, uh, federal charges or some kind of federal investigation, Hallie. The state attorney general's office making clear in the press conference earlier that just because there will be no state criminal charges, that does not preclude the family from filing a civil lawsuit. So we could also see civil action taken against the city of Akron, perhaps against the police department of those officers. So that's something we'll also be looking for. And again, this community is bracing for the possibility of protests. But at this point, I can tell you, at least in this downtown area we are where we are right now, it is quiet and it appears to be largely business as usual here. But again, it is obvious what's going on here, Allie. Jesse Kirsch, live for us in Akron. Jesse, thank you so much. We are just now learning the names of the four people killed after another mass shooting. This one at a Sweet 16 party near Montgomery, Alabama. You see the names here. Corbin Holston, Marcia Collins, Shankivia Smith, and Fulstavius Dowdell, who was 18 years old. He was just about to play football at Jacksonville State University. He played wide receiver, defensive back. His coach says, Phil did it all. And there's this terrible picture sticking with our team of the fire department, cleaning off a bloody handprint from the dance studio. A lot of questions on this investigation. Police aren't saying who the shooter is, if they even have a person of interest. On top of that, no clue on a motive. Why would somebody target a 16-year-old birthday party? It's not clear how the 28 other people who got hurt in the shooting are doing, if they were shot or just got hurt trying to run to safety. This attack now has more victims, dead and or hurt, of any shooting this year. We're going to come back to this story in a moment, but we also want to take you to Missouri here, where for the first time we are now hearing from prosecutors about the, shoot the shooting of a 16-year-old black teenager who was shot showing up to the wrong home over the weekend. Let's listen. This is an A felony. It carries with it a range of punishment of up to life. In count two, the defendant is charged with armed criminal action. This is an unclassified felony. Encouraged with it a range of punishment between three to 15 years. The state is alleging the defendant committed the felony of assault in the first degree as charged in count one by, with, and through the knowing use, assistance, and aid of a deadly weapon. As a result of these charges, a warrant was issued for Mr. Lester's arrest. 
and bond was set at $200,000. Our office worked closely with the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department during this case, and we would not be here today but for their hard work. We understand how frustrating this has been, but I can assure you that the criminal sus justice system is working and will continue to work. As with any serious case, we approached this one in an objective and impartial manner. We look forward to obtaining a just result. With that being said, and understanding this is a pending criminal matter, I will do my best to answer a few questions. Mr. President, from Fox 4, how did you arrive at this so quickly? Just yesterday, we were doing the news conference, and so little was known. Now the case file is brought over to the KCPD today, and we're here just a couple hours later. A charging decision was not made until a thorough review of the file occurred. We worked closely with the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department during the course of the investigation and used information from that investigation in making our decision. Mr. Lester, is Lester in custody? My understanding is Mr. Lester is not in custody. The arrest warrant was recently issued. It's my understanding that the appropriate law enforcement agencies have this information and are taking appropriate action. Why no murder charge or attempted murder? Sure. The defendant is charged with an A felony. It's the highest level of offense in the state of Missouri. It carries with it a range of punishment of 10 to 30 years or life imprisonment. Other charges may not carry that same level of range of punishment. Can you say anything about what happened with what he's alleged? I don't want to litigate this case in the press. It's been my goal from the very beginning to get justice for the child involved in the case, and I don't want to jeopardize that by talking about the facts to the media. Are possible hate crime charges protected here? So in the state of Missouri, hate crimes can be E or D felonies, which carry with it a lower range of punishment than what the defendant is currently charged with. But they could still be brought, right? I'm not sure I understand. You could still add additional charges. At that point, you would be talking about double jeopardy issues. I know that the men and women of the Kansas City Police Department worked very hard on this case. There were things that had to be done in order to build it on a solid foundation. That means attempting to get a formal statement from the witness in the case. That means waiting for forensic laboratory results to be processed. I don't have that information. Was there a racial component to this case? As the prosecutor of Clay County, I can tell you there was a racial component to the case. I'm not sure. I mean, what? What do you mean? Was anything said that made me believe that this was a racially motivated shooting? Sure. Everyone here, we've made copies of the probable cause statement to hand out to members of the press. There is no indication of anything like that within the probable cause statement. What's to be said with the stand your ground castle doctrine and all that? People were asking whether that would be a factor. Sure. Self-defense in the state of Missouri is controlled by Section 565031 and states subject to the provisions contained in the statute that a person may use physical force upon another person to the extent he or she reasonably believes such to be necessary to defend himself or herself or a third person from what he or she reasonably believes to be the use of imminent use or unlawful force. Beyond that, I don't want to comment specifics on the case in order to protect the integrity of the process. Do you know why Mr. Lester was only held for about an hour at the police department before he was let go? So in Missouri, the charges have to be filed within 24 hours of arrest or the defendant or suspect is released. In this case, it was clear that additional investigation needed to be done so that the case could be built upon a solid foundation. Do you believe he's still in the area? I don't have any information regarding his specific whereabouts, but as my understanding, law enforcement is aware of the situation is taking all appropriate action. Does he have any kind of criminal history to your knowledge? And this is 
I hate to sound uh, repeat myself, but I, I th would not think it's appropriate to comment on anyone's criminal history uh, into the media. And that's the reason I'm doing that is because I want to achieve justice for the victim in the case, and I don't want to jeopardize that by litigating the case in the media. This, the defendant? I'm sorry, um, yes. He's 85 years old. 85. And he's a white male, black male? He's a white male. And uh, how many times did Mr. Lester shoot the young man? The probable cause statement indicates that he shot twice. In which area of the body? Uh, the head and arm. Did the probable cause statement where Mr. Lester was when he shot? Inside the house? It does contain information about uh, the whereabouts of Mr. Lester when he discharged his firearm. Did he shoot through a, a glass door or window? The probable cause statement indicates that uh, rounds were fired through uh, a glass door. And the young man never entered the home in any way. They were on the front doorstep, presumably. The probable cause statement indicates that uh, the victim in the case did not cross the threshold. Did they knock on the door or ring the bell? That, so th those facts may be in dispute, uh, so I'm not going to comment on that. And it's still your opinion or the belief that they were there picking up siblings and they were there by the state? That's, that's the evidence we have in the probable cause statement. So do these charges mean, in your judgment, Mr. Lester did not act reasonably? After a thorough review of the, of the, the case, the the facts of the case, I believe that a felony uh, assault charges were appropriate and also armed criminal action charges. Can you tell us who you spoke when they interacted? The probable cause statement does not indicate that any words were exchanged. What resources are you aware of that could show some of those facts that are in dispute as far as home surveillance or police uh, dash cam video? As part of the investigation, uh, law enforcement uh, investigated that possibility that uh, the incident would have been caught on camera, on video. Uh, that is not part of the case file. Did anyone else witness this? It, it's my understanding, no. The probable cause statement does not indicate that. And if there was no doorbell video, I'm sorry, you've already answered that, but was there any other video of any type? Sure, the probable cause statement indicates that there was no uh, video of the incident. Do you know what the gun was? It was a 32 revolver. Do you know if Mr. Lester had a, 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 like a right, oh, I know he has a right to carry, does he have a, any sort of credentials or anything like that? Any sort of paperwork? I don't have any information in regard to that. Can you tell us what level penalty you'll be seeking on the uh, so the range of punishment on the A felony is between 10 and 30 years or life imprisonment. The range of punishment on the armed criminal action is uh, 3 to 15 years. And that being said, that's the range of punishment available um, in the case. As far as trial strategy and, and talking about the case and litigating in the case in the media, I'm not going to do that because it's important to me to protect the integrity of the process and get justice for the victim. What have the conversations been like with the family? We are continuing to make efforts uh, to speak with the family. Uh, I visited uh, the house uh, today, and I look forward uh, to communicating with them further. I just want to clarify, you've not made, there's no, made contact with Lester since. I'm sorry? You've not, you've, not, you've not made contact with Lester. I've not made contact with the defendant, no. What would be your message to the community? My message to the community is that in Clay County, we enforce the laws and we follow the laws, and that does not matter where you come from or what you look like or how much money you have. Everyone is held to the same standard. And nothing about this process was different than any other investigation in your mind? I think the Kansas City Police Department worked extremely hard. Lab results were obtained on an extremely short timeline. Uh, that's not something you see every day. All right. If there are no more further questions, I thank you for your time. 
A number of key pieces of new information that we are hearing from the prosecuting attorney in Clay County, Missouri, Zach Johnson there. Specifically, the charges will be brought against the 85-year-old man, Andrew Lester, who is white, in the shooting of a 16-year-old black teenager who apparently showed up at Lester's home, mistakenly thinking he was at the home where he was supposed to be picking up his twin brothers there. Lester is not in custody, now charged with multiple felonies, including assault. And you heard the prosecuting attorney there say that there was a racial component to this case. We understand, based on the information released by Mr. Thompson and included in the probable cause documents that he described, that Lester shot Ralph Yarl. You see Yarl's picture there. Twice, through a glass door, once in the head and once in the arm. We understand from Yarl's attorneys and family members that Yarl is home. He has been released from the hospital. He has a traumatic brain injury, not able to speak yet, has not regained his speech, but they are hoping and praying for a full recovery. I want to bring in now our legal analyst, Barbara McQuaid. And Barbara, I'm wondering uh, how you see these charges here. The prosecu prosecuting attorney was specific that they did not bring hate crime charges because he says that would have indicated double jeopardy and the charges they did bring, these felonies are more serious, but he was clear that there was a racial component in this case. Yeah, it sounds like from his description of the probable cause uh, statement that, um, you know, this man uh, intended to assault uh, the teen when he pulled the, the gun and pulled the trigger. Uh, there's no evidence, uh, at least described there, of intent to kill. It could be because of the way the situation unfolded. I heard a question about whether self-defense might be raised. But uh, as you heard the prosecutor describe, it sounds like under Missouri law, self-defense requires a reasonableness standard. That is, a reasonable person must have feared for their life when they took action. If this is a teen who simply rang the doorbell and asked for his little brothers, it's hard to imagine that there is a reasonable fear here. It reminds me a little bit of the Bernard Getz case uh, back in the 80s, if you remember this case, where Bernard Getz was charged with shooting black teens on a subway train, uh, believing that you know they were going to harm him when they simply asked him for money uh, and he shot them. Um, and it was, again, described as you know, maybe he acted in fear, but that was based on a racial bias that belonged to him and was not reasonable. And so I imagine that same analysis will play out here, and it sounds like the charges will be solid under Missouri law. And what would the defense strategy potentially be based on what we know? I mean, you've laid out here what the prosecution would presumably go after and what they have um, begun to delineate here. Yeah, I, I think that it'd be important to look at uh, the defendant's mental state. He's 85 mm -hmm. years old, and so perhaps uh, there is some sort of potential diminished capacity argument that could be asserted here that uh, for, for that he had reasonable reasons that uh, he was in fear of that situation, and looking at it through his eyes as opposed to the eyes of the victim, who clearly was doing nothing wrong, simply uh, dutifully picking up uh, his brother is doing an errand for his family. Um, so it, it's hard to know without knowing all of the facts, but it seems like any sort of self-defense here is likely to fail. What are the next steps here, Barbara? We heard from Mr. Thompson that Andrew Lester, again, the suspect, the defendant here in this case, accused of shooting Ralph Yarl, who's 16 years old, twice, as they all came to the door. Again, you heard him say that apparently with the revolver, Lester, they say, shot him through the glass door, that Yarl never attempted to come into the home, never attempted to cross the threshold based on what they know now. What are the next steps here? Lester is not in custody. The law enforcement, as you heard Mr. Thompson say, is presumably uh, aware of that and, and working to arrest him based on these charges. Where does this go? Yeah, I imagine he would be arrested. He would appear in court unless a judge determines that he is either a danger to the community or a risk of flight. Uh, I imagine he would be released on bail. And then uh, there would be dis exchange of discovery, plea negotiations. And then if he wants to contest his guilt, a trial and a sentencing. It could be that this is the kind of case where there is a felony conviction and any sort of mitigating circumstances can be dealt with at the sentencing. And so, in other words, uh, he may admit his guilt and then ask a judge to use leniency in deciding what the sentence ought to be in light of extenuating factors. Age alone is not 
a reason for a shortened sentence. You don't get, uh, you know, a free pass on crime just because you're old. But sometimes if you can say that there are factors uh, about uh, diminished capacity or other kinds of things, sometimes those can be mitigating factors for a reduced sentence, even where liability is clear. Barbara McQuaid, thank you so much for that legal analysis. We will, of course, have much more coverage of these developments out of Missouri throughout the evening here on NBC News Now. We're taking out of Dadeville, Alabama, where a Sweet 16 birthday party shooting has led to the deaths of four people. We know that about 28 people, nearly 30 people in all, were hurt. I want to bring in Priscilla Thompson, who is on the ground in Dadeville for us tonight. And Priscilla, lots of questions here about this investigation. What do we know and where does this go? Yeah, Hallie, police have not held a press conference in the last 24 hours. The last presser they did was yesterday evening, and we haven't heard from them all day today. And this is there are still a lot of questions about how all of this unfolded, whether they have identified or arrested a suspect. And of course, the question of motive, why someone decided to do this. Now, what we did hear from police during that presser is that they are asking anyone in the community with information to come forward. They say that they there is no tip too small as they work to piece together how all of this happened. And meanwhile, this community is grieving and continuing to wait for answers. Hallie? Priscilla Thompson live for us there in Dadeville. Priscilla, thank you very much for those updates. Appreciate it. We are going now to a tense and testy scene with House Republicans trekking north to New York for a kind of field trip to talk violent crime in that city. Not exactly friendly territory for those Republican members, including Judiciary Chairman Jim Jordan. Listen to some of the response in the building. You're a scumbag. Every time I tell you this. I got you all on video with your face. The hearing is a sham. The hearing is a sham. This hearing is supposed to highlight what Republicans see as the way Manhattan DA Alvin Bragg is, in their view, neglecting issues about crime to instead focus more on pursuing charges against former President Trump. But if Alvin Bragg had not indicted Mr. Trump this month, would this hearing even be happening at all? I believe this hearing would be happening regardless, whether it would be today or later on in the year, because this is an issue that I've been highlighting and pressing uh, with my colleagues over and over again. Keep in mind the context here. New York is actually one of the safest big cities in the country. You see the top 15 most dangerous cities in America, according to one list. New York's not on it. NBC's Ryan Nobles is outside where that hearing was in New York for us. Ryan, normally your beat is here in Washington with me over on Capitol Hill. You are in New York because House Republicans have taken sort of their scene on the road, um, up here talking issues of violent crime. They talk about a spike. We are seeing, in reality, some of the numbers for issues like murder, rape, robbery, other violent crimes. Is this about politics? Is this about crime? Is this about Donald Trump or all of it? It's really about all of it, Hallie, and, and Republicans really had two goals today. First off, there's no doubt that they wanted to tarnish the image of the district attorney, Alvin Bragg, especially in light of his indictment of the former president, Donald Trump, of which the majority of this House Judiciary Republican caucus uh, is a big supporter of. But there was a secondary effort here to really make crime a big issue. This was something that Republicans, particularly here in New York, ran on in the 2022 midterms. It's an issue that Republicans believe will be at the forefront in 2024 as well. Take a listen to some of the arguments they made today during this hearing. You can resist arrest, deal drugs, obstruct arrest, and even carry a gun to get away with it. Yeah, I think a lot of people walk around the city very scared right now. There is a catastrophic crime crisis across America. Now, the district attorney obviously disagrees. He put out a statement in response uh, to the Republican hearing today, and he said that, quote, for outside politicians to appear in New York City on the taxpayer dime for a political stunt is a slap in the face to the dedicated NYPD officers, prosecutors, and other public servants. So you saw a back and forth here between Republicans and Democrats. Democrats didn't have to participate today. They chose to show up. They even had a few witnesses on the dais. One of the things that they brought up, Hallie, that they think Republicans are just ignoring is the access to guns. And they say mm. that the reason New York City has such a gun violence problem isn't because of the laws here, but the lax laws in red states like Georgia, North Carolina, and South Carolina, yeah. where many of these guns originate before ending up here in New York City.
this is not also over, right, between House Republicans and Alvin Bragg. It's not like this New York thing was the end of the road here. Republicans want to see Bragg basically on Capitol Hill. They want to hear him testify about why and how and details on his indictment and arraignment of Donald Trump. Alvin Bragg's like, hey, stay in your lane, Congress. Are we ever going to see him talking about this, or is that legal fight just going to be more and more um, extended as the days go on? Well, Hallie, it's important to keep in mind who developed the roadmap for ignoring a congressional subpoena or a request by a congressional committee to appear. And that was Jim Jordan and many of his fellow House Republicans, as you recall, during the investigation by the January 6th Select Committee. Uh, and it seems as though Alvin Bragg is basically reading from their playbook, right? Uh, he has filed a lawsuit to try and prevent a subpoena that was handed out by one of the former assistant district attorneys, Mark Pomerantz, who wrote a book on this subject. Uh, and he's even put in that lawsuit kind of a, a, a an effort to pre butt a subpoena for his office as well. So, yes, this is likely going to be a lengthy court battle uh, between the two sides, whether or not it ever results in any tangible information going from the uh, from the district attorney's office to the House Judiciary Committee is probably unlikely. But, Hallie, for many of these Republicans, it's just about the optics. It's just about doing everything they can to try and downplay the work of this district attorney, especially because Donald Trump is under the prosecution of this office right now. Hallie. Ryan Nobles live for us there in Manhattan. Ryan, thank you much. Today, the judge overseeing that huge Fox Dominion defamation trial that everybody's been waiting for is telling reporters that, hey, a last-minute change of plans isn't really all that unusual as he delayed the trial until tomorrow. Why? Why is it delayed? That is the question. We don't know for sure the answer, but there's been a whole lot of speculation that maybe it's because there could be an 11th-hour settlement right before this case is supposed to go to trial between Fox and Dominion. At the center of this case, remember, is whether or not Fox defamed Dominion voting systems by airing lies about their voting machines after the 2020 presidential election. Dominion had sued for $1.6 billion. We'll see if there is a settlement, what the number turns out to be. Stephanie Gosk is joining us now. So, Steph, two things to talk about here with you. First, what do we know about where things stand? Tomorrow morning, are you going to be talking to us about the trial starting, or are we going to be talking about a settlement. Let's start there. Okay, Hallie. Well, could there be a settlement? Yeah. But there, that has been the case all along. That will be the yeah. case all the way through the trial. That could even be the case while the jury is deliberating. There could still, there could still be a settlement. A lot of us went into court this morning hoping that the judge was going to clarify why there was this delay. He did not. He actually told us, and it was mostly media in the room, he told us he does not hold press conferences in his courtroom. He then had a quick sidebar with the, the attorneys who were there and then said, we are on schedule to start this trial tomorrow. And that's going to be a couple of things. The first thing they need to do is one matter with the jury. They've got to go through. They have an opportunity to strike jurors. They have to actually sit the main jury. So each side gets a dozen strikes, essentially, and then the jury will sit, and then it will be opening arguments, and, and we will be off to the races. As you say, there have been reports that there were the, the settlement negotiations were going on. NBC News has not confirmed those reports, and uh, d at this moment, Dominion and Fox are not commenting on them, Hallie. So let me take part two with you here, Steph, because I want people to know who are watching this is going to be the beginning of potentially six weeks or longer of talking about some of the headlines from this trial. And if somebody is sitting there going, who cares? Yeah. Why do I care? There is a real mm. reason to care right. here. And I want you to lay it out. It has to do with the First Amendment. It has to do with what people can say about you or your business, right? Sure. There, there are a lot of issues. The way the, the First Amendment works, and specifically this issue of libel law, is that is that you are mm -hmm. protected from saying things that are lies about someone, the press particularly, if you haven't done it with malice, with actual malice. And what that what does that mean? That means that you didn't know that it was a lie or you did your due diligence in making sure that it wasn't a lie. And then if it turns out it was a lie, you're still protected. So Fox News says that's what we did. Um, we had anchors who who believed there was something there. They were waiting for evidence that they did not actually endorse what they thought were lies. And that has been the thrust of, of some of their arguments. They also argue that it was newsworthy, that, that, that there were, for the president was, had these wild claims about election fraud, and that because the president was making those claims, 
it was newsworthy. Now, what's interesting in this case is the judge has already ruled that all of the statements that are at the center of this entire case were false. The judge said that they were false. So now this is really about that actual malice part. And what Dominion says is that they've got the proof that it was there and they intend to show it in court, Hallie. Stephanie Goss, live for us there in Wilmington, Delaware. I bet you will be talking again um, for some reason or another tomorrow, Steph. Thank you. I think so. The United Nations saying today that at least 180 people are dead. Nearly 2,000 people are hurt after airstrikes and shelling and gun attacks, with two rival generals fighting for control of Sudan. What we're hearing out of this shows that really nowhere in the capital is safe, with EU officials saying their ambassador to Sudan was assaulted in his home earlier tonight. It is a stunning turn for this country, which just four years ago got rid of its longtime autocratic leader in favor of democracy. And something that's fairly rare, we've heard now from officials from the U.S., from the U.K., from Russia, from China, all of them calling for an end to the violence. And Secretary of State Tony Blinken today calling for a return to a government led by civilians. Listen. People in Sudan want the military back in the barracks. They want democracy. They want a civilian-led government. Sudan needs to return to that path. NBC's Keir Simmons is covering this for us. Um, and we're always glad to have you in D.C., especially on a big day where we're covering diplomatic issues like right. this one. Um, Americans are there in Sudan. They yeah. can't get out, can't get out of the airports. Everything is uh, a mess, as we've, heard, as we've heard it laid out. And you're talking with people there who are hearing this and seeing this firsthand. Yeah, and we've been monitoring this, and we're into the middle of the night now in uh, Sudan yeah. and getting into the fourth day of all this, and it doesn't seem to be quietening. And, and you're right, there are Americans there. Uh, real worries now for the civilian population. I'll just uh, update you. A, a group called the Central Committee of Sudanese Doctors telling us tonight that nine hospitals nationwide across Sudan um, have been shut down, five of those because uh, they were uh, bombed, at uh, 10 on the verge of, of shutting down across the country. So really serious issues on the hospital side. They don't seem to be not targeting hospitals. Then you've got power going down, you've got water going down. You mentioned Americans. We spoke to an American travel writer there in Khartoum who, who said, it's chaos. She said at first she thought it was thunderstorms, then realized uh, that in fact it was fighting. She saw the fighting just blocks away. She, get this, she was on the finish line of the Boston bombing, marathon bombing. Uh, Ten and, years ago? Right. And wow. so she's experienced that. She says it was like that, but nothing like that. And, and her experience then gave her some ability to try and kind of pull herself together and survive. But, you know, the, the, the U.S. ambassador, is, you, you know, is, is sheltering in place tonight. Right. Uh, you mentioned the EU ambassador it, it appears to have been assaulted in his own home. Uh, it's, it's chaos. So how does the chaos end? How yeah, does question. this stop? Yeah, good question. We are hearing from Reuters uh, quoting Egyptian security officials, two Egyptian security officials, that the UAE, the United Arab Emirates and Egypt are trying to get to a ceasefire. You mentioned hmm. the calls for ceasefire, for ceasefires from uh, around the world. Uh, but you do have two... Uh, military leaders who are feuding here and, and, and what was the hopes for a democracy are on fire uh, because these two uh, leaders uh, appear to be battling over who gets to take power and it, it doesn't look uh, like, like there's a resolution to that. Explain why this set off so intensely the way that it did when it did. Yeah, look, it, it, <laughs> this part of, of Africa is, is a tinderbox in many places. In Sudan, we've seen that the longtime uh, autocrat overthrown uh, some years ago. So trying to get to a civilian government was not easy. Um, it is a place that is strategically important. You've seen the Russians in there, obviously the US and, and Europe trying to have influence. And anyone who knows anything about that kind of thing knows that doesn't necessarily help. Uh, although, of course, um, you know, Europe and, and the US will be, will be trying to, to get some kind of stability and will have been trying to do that. So it's, it's a battle over resources between two militaries who are determined to try to win over and kind of democracy is getting... Pushed aside. Democracy getting pushed aside. Americans, other international travelers, as you point out, caught in the middle of this. Yeah. Keir Simmons, thank you for being all over for us. Appreciate it. Yeah. Coming up here on the show, the Los Angeles District Attorney receiving allegations of sexual assault against actor Army Hammer. What we know about this investigation, plus a new vaccine that could be a real potential, meaningful step forward in the fight against melanoma. That's coming up in the five things. Stay with us.
NBC News learning today that the Los Angeles District Attorney's Office has now received the case of sexual assault against actor Army Hammer related to a case the LAPD opened back in 2021. That's according to a source familiar with the investigation. In a statement, the DA's office says the LAPD presented a case for them to look at. They didn't officially specify which case. NBC News reached out to Hammer. His lawyer says they're not commenting right now. In the past, he said his interactions with his partners have always been consensual. Hammer's been into big movies like The Social Network, Call Me By Your Name, and The Man From U.N.C.L.E. Aaron McLaughlin is covering this for us in L.A. Explain what we know, Aaron, and where this goes. Hey, Holly. Well, a source with knowledge of the investigation tells NBC News that the case currently being reviewed by the Los Angeles District Attorney's Office has to do with allegations that were made back in February of 2021. That is when a woman who identified herself as Effie came forward very publicly accusing Hammer of during the course of a four-year relationship that took place between 2016 and 2020. She alleges that in 2017, Army Hammer violently uh, assaulted her, sexually assaulted her over the course of some four hours. She made the accusation in a very public uh, press conference alongside her then attorney, Gloria Allred, who is no longer representing her. Now, at the time, Army Hammer. Uh, denied the allegations, his attorney releasing a statement, all of Hammer's sexual relationships have been completely consensual, discussed and agreed upon in advance and mutually participatory. Now, we know from this source that this investigation has concluded, has been sent to the district attorney. It's unclear how long this could be, the so-called review process could take place or if charges will, in fact, be filed. We reached out to uh, Army Hammer and his attorney for comment today. They declined to comment on this latest development. We also reached out to Effie, and we have not heard back from her. Holly. Aaron McLaughlin, thank you very much for that. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, new research shows an experimental mRNA vaccine, when combined with an immunotherapy drug, actually cut down the chance of melanoma, of dying from it or getting it back, actually recurring, by like 44%. Moderna and Merck funded the study, paid for the study. It found the patients treated with that combination also did better health-wise than people who were only treated with the immunotherapy drug. Number two, David's bridal is filing for bankruptcy. Again, the wedding dress seller says it's looking for a buyer and that stores will stay open as normal in the meantime. The company laid off more than 9,000 workers a couple days ago. It last filed for bankruptcy in 2018. Number three, controversial Congressman George Santos says he will run again for election in 2024, re-election. Remember, he's facing calls to step down. He's also facing a bunch of investigations because he repeatedly lied about his background, both before he was elected and since he's been in office. Number four, Hollywood writers just voted to authorize a strike if their talks with the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers doesn't end in a new three-year contract. The current one is set to expire May 1st. The writers want more money and better working conditions. Negotiations are supposed to pick back up today. Number five, an upgrade from Mickey D's, at least for its burgers. The fast food chain, McDonald's, says its burgers will have a softer bun, more melty cheese, more of a caramelized flavor, and more Big Mac sauce. They want to do the upgrade try to drive some sales up coming up here on the show two tons of cocaine found floating off italy and what officials call one of it the biggest drug seizures ever look at that how much it's all worth in the global a new twist tonight in the political power struggle between florida's governor and disney with ron DeSantis now threatening to maybe let a new prison be built right near the park one of the state's biggest tourist attractions. And that's not all we're hearing from DeSantis today, is he's rolling out a new plan to try and stop Disney from having so much control of the land it's built on. Like, for example, right now, the park's rides are exempt from state exemptions, excuse me, from inspections, rather. So DeSantis is suggesting maybe that changes. Maybe now Disney has to face the prospect of inspectors going in to check out the rides, check out the monorail. There's also a lot of questions to what happens to the land around Disney, which the governor says could potentially be redeveloped. Listen. People have said, you know, maybe maybe have a, another, uh, maybe create a state park, maybe try to do more amusement uh, parks. Uh, someone even said, like, maybe you need another state prison. Who knows? I mean, I just think that the, the possibilities are, 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 are endless. 
It is just the latest move, you can say, in this Florida feud. Remember, it started when Disney spoke up against the state's controversial so-called don't say gay law last year. DeSantis didn't like that, so he installed some allies to try and take control of a board that oversees the district Disney's in. Except Disney, before he did, made its own surprise power play to keep control. Sam Brock is covering this in for us live from Florida. Um, chances that any of this happens, right? Because the idea that DeSantis could allow a prison to be built right next to Disney or maybe a competing amusement park, he's not saying, and we played it there definitively, this is going to happen. He's just saying, hey, like maybe it could, right? I mean, it's a fascinating um, political plot line here. It is. And, you know, just DeSantis' facial expressions, as we were listening to that soundbite a second ago, Hallie, he seems to be smirking. So who knows if he even is taking that aspect of it seriously. But to your original point, you know, what are the odds that these measures are going to actually work? And the fact that DeSantis has to resort to them in the first place tells you he was caught off guard. So the new board, the five allies that you just described, that is the Central Florida Tourism Oversight Board, they are going to meet on Wednesday and, according to the governor, basically just revoke the agreements that Disney came up on its own with, which is to protect Disney's autonomy for maintaining this special district that allows them to tax city services, all sorts of land development. So if that doesn't work, the governor says then the state legislature will get involved. They will void and nullify it because they have the right statutorily to do that. But Disney says, no, look, these agreements that we came up to before the legislature made that move, they were all done in a public noticed forum and are totally legitimate. OK, fine. That almost, um, even though that is the reality of what's happening on the ground, there is the specter of the politics overlay, Sam, as I don't have to tell you. Ron DeSantis yeah. is extremely likely to be running for president. I've talked with sources who are familiar with his planning um, who suggest that that's going to happen in a matter of, of not months likely, but weeks here. Um, there is, and here he is, we're talking about him on a national stage because of this fight he has and has been feuding with Disney. By the way, which brings in a lot of money to the state of tourism, uh, to the state of Florida from a tourism perspective. I mean, that is part of the filter to this, Sam. 100 percent. You can't ignore the political context here, Hallie, which is the fact that in polling, at least, DeSantis has been ceding ground to former President Trump. This issue, specifically Disney and Don't Say Gay, was sort of what boosted him to become perceived as this culture wars warrior for yeah. parts of his base. And yet yep. now Disney's punching back. When you talk to legal experts, they are very skeptical about his argument that he can target them because of the special tax district, because he's already talked about Don't Say Gay and that being the impetus for it. Here's what I heard from a local attorney um, and his interpretation. They have an argument. The problem is that it's directly tied to something Disney said, that is their political stance on a matter, which means that the First Amendment comes into play. And you cannot retaliate against uh, anybody uh, for their protected speech, such as stating opposition to the law. And that includes corporations. And, Hallie, to put an exclamation point on this, as much as Governor DeSantis has been talking about social issues here in the state of Florida, he did not bring that up today in that 30 to 45-minute press conference. Right. He didn't say specifically this, this law or whatever is, is part of the impetus for it. Uh, it's an important nope. note. Sam Brock, thank you very much. Appreciate it. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our foreign desk has done it for you. Here's some of what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. In France, a court has cleared Air France and Airbus of involuntary manslaughter about 14 years after an airliner crashed into the Atlantic on a flight from Rio de Janeiro to Paris, killing everybody on board. Family members of the 228 victims had demanded justice, but prosecutors said formal blame could not be proven. In Russia, the U.S. ambassador to Russia, Lynn Tracy, making her first visit to Evan Gershkovich, that detained American journalist, the Wall Street Journal reporter who is being held there. Tracy tweeted from the embassy account saying he's in good health and remains strong. Gershkovich has been detained on spying charges for the last few weeks. Both the Wall Street Journal and the Biden administration have repeatedly denied that that was the case. From Italy, take a look. I want to show you what's in the water here. All of that, about $440 million worth of cocaine found off the coast of Sicily. Italian police found it all during a routine surveillance flight. They think it was left by a passing cargo ship so it could be picked up and then brought to shore by drug traffickers. It's one of the biggest drug seizures ever in Italy's history. 
Still to come, love is not patient, at least if you ask the fans of Netflix's Love is Blind, how the streaming giant just accidentally may have made the case for traditional live TV. It was supposed to be one of the buzziest live shows of the season, the Love is Blind reunion on Netflix, with maybe millions of people tuning in. The countdown on. And 19 hours after showtime, the countdown was still going up until about three and a half hours ago when Netflix finally rolled out this show on tape after a just massive live production fiasco. Vanessa Lachey, one of the hosts, apologizing, even as Netflix's stock took a ding today, all of it, raising questions about what the business model looks like for streamers who want to get in on what the broadcast companies have been doing for years, big live events. Because after all, that's one of the few things left that tons of people are actually watching all together all at the same time. It's partly why you're seeing, for example, Amazon get in on streaming football, Apple TV Plus, Peacock with baseball. Sports is a huge draw for audiences. It's live. It's an event. But what could it mean down the road if streaming platforms can't actually get it done from a production perspective? What does that mean for those audiences and those eyeballs? Let's bring in Jake Ward. Then Jake, listen. In Netflix's defense, they did pull off a live comedy special featuring Chris Rock last month. Fine. But given what an epic fail this reunion show thing was last night, how do they come back from this? You know, I, I think, I mean, first of all, right, let's be clear, Hallie, right, that this, the company's going to be fine. They're doing just fine in the money department, well, okay, in the okay, audience okay. department. I don't, right, mean, from a, I don't mean from a bottom of line perspective. Of in that way. No, I get you. I'm I get talking you. about, like, if they're trying right. to get but from this being the this reputational thing, yes. yeah. Yes, yes. That's right. Well, I think that, you know, if you're going to try to move into live, which is this basically this effort on their part and on the part of all sorts of streaming platforms to try and find a new market, especially as Netflix and other platforms like this begin to discover that they may have really tapped out, you know, gotten to the very peak of the streaming market. They may have sold as many subscriptions to this as they're going to on their current business model. They're looking for something new. And so the question here winds up being, is this a single embarrassing debacle in which they just did not have the production capability? Capability. Supposedly a new production company had been brought on for this fourth season, and maybe that's where the problem is. Uh, the reporting from inside Netflix seems to be this was some sort of technical issue. You and I who work in live television think, oh, you know, how hard could it be? I mean, we work really hard, but, you know, you can get this thing done. <laughs> I don't done. think how hard can it be. But I, I do think, think not how hard can it be. We know how hard it is. And, like, it's a whole specialty, right? That's it's right. not just something that you can dabble in on the side. I, I mean, my two cents on that. That turns out to be the case. That's exactly right. But I think in the f what we're going to see is more and more people try to attempt this, especially with all the buzz they got around this, even as they failed to pull this one off on time. What, what's so interesting to me, and you're talking about it here, right? It, it is the reputational piece of it. Because, yeah, Netflix, from a business perspective, will be just fine. They are the king of binge TV. But you've got Amazon doing sports. We talked about Apple, Peacock, et cetera. Um, and so much of this seems to be, and I say sports because that is one of the last big things that people want to watch live because it's happening, you're sort of this communal event, but it's happening is there's all these sort of silos that seem to be coming down in the eyes of viewers between streaming and broadcast and cable, right? We talk about this a lot all the time, not just because we are on a streaming channel here, but because that's where the business, the business world is. Content is content, and it doesn't matter how you get it these days. I think that's right. I think, though, we are seeing something really weird here in this moment where you have these major platforms fighting for sports, right, because that market is intended, you know, is expected to, to go from being worth about $19 billion uh, a couple of years ago to being worth uh, over $90 billion come 2030. The live streaming of sports continues to grow as a business. But what's also weird here, Hallie, is at the same time that we're talking about the death of live television, live streaming of just YouTubers, right, and people on Instagram and people on TikTok, that is exploding. And psychologists, I've been spending the last 24 hours ever since this debacle took place looking into the psychology of this stuff. There's a word for this. They call it social presence. This is the mm. psychological effect of being present with someone, even through the mediating effects of television or a phone or anything else. We like to feel that we are live with someone. It has all of these sort of secondary impacts that psychologists struggle to really tell us why they happen, but they can see that they are there. We feel closer to people. We're more likely yeah. to buy products. I get people that. like live stuff. So all of that is happening, even as this particular production company definitely uh, uh, did not pull this one off. Uh, uh, quite the flop, in fact, indeed. Jake Ward, uh, thank you very much. Fascinating stuff. I appreciate it.
We will have more for you here, of course, tomorrow, since that is a wrap for this hour, these two hours for us, a busy couple of them, to start off the week here with you. It is good to be with you, as always, on NBC News Now. More coverage right here. For now, top story. We'll pick up our coverage right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.